You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guests today are Dave Arlen, Lisa Dietrich, and Joe Slash. What do they have in common? Well, at one time or another, they worked for the incomparable Bill Hudnut, whose time as mayor spanned 16 years, and what he left, as opposed to what he found, is probably the greatest transformation in the history of any modern city in the United States, and we're going to talk about that, talk about his time as mayor. Joe Slash was deputy mayor from 1978 to 1989 in the Hudnut administration, Lisa Dietrich served as his executive assistant, then ran his reelect in 1983 and in 1987. After you tamed Bill Hudnut, didn't you go tame Ed Tracy? (laughs) I did, yes. Well, yeah, not that that could be accomplished, but I did go work for Ed Tracy post Bill Hudnut. Former podcast guest, Mr. Tracy, and Dave Arlen, who served as his final press secretary in the Hudnut administration, then went to go work for RCA with my dear uncle, Ed Milburn, who I know is going to be listening to this. And Dave, thank you very much. And I need to say this because if it was not for Dave Arlen and a phone call he made to me on a Saturday morning, I never would have known about the open position for communications director at the Indiana Republican Party. He called and told me it was available and I should apply for it, and I did, and the wonderful Jennifer Hollowell gave me that position, and it changed me my life. So, Dave Arlen, thank you. Well, what a sweet thing to say <laughs> at the very start. I you hope you're still thanking me afterwards. Yes. <laughs> well, all three of these folks have made their mark. They're wonderfully kind people who certainly give a hell of a lot more than they take, and they worked for someone who loved this city. We're going to start with Deputy Mayor Slash. Joe, thank you for your time today. Thanks for inviting me. Enjoying it and looking forward to it. Bill Hudnut was elected mayor the first time in 1975. You joined his administration in 1978. What made you decide to venture into local government at that level? Well, and what was it about him that made that choice easy. Well, it's uh, interesting how I got um, asked to come into the administration. Um, uh, I'm a CPA by profession and work for what's now Ernst & Young. It was Arthur Young at the time. And I was the manager assigned to oversee all the work we were doing for the city. And a project that had started uh, while Mayor Luger was in office to um, analyze the city's finances and help them complete the consolidation of um, city-county finances. And um, we were also concerned about the unrecorded debt the city had. And so anyway, uh, I led that project and uh, assisted the uh, city to convert from uh, cash to accrual accounting and uh, that's how I got to meet both Mayor uh, Luger and Hudnut, and um, really got to know Hudnut pretty well during that process of completing the project. And um, he kept talking to me about, I'm going to need somebody to implement all these recommendations you made. And um, the firm said, you know, um, 
maybe you ought to consider doing this. We'll give you a leave of absence, and if uh, things don't work out with you and the mayor, um, come on back. Well, guess what? Um, boy, did we have fun. The mayor and I got along and hit it off right away, and uh, we just absolutely had fun working together. But he, I had written over along with my staff um, a very lengthy management letter with um, criticisms and concerns of financial weaknesses and plenty of recommendations. Um, mainly the consolidation wasn't a real consolidation between total city and county. There was a lot of um, things that still needed to be um, moved over and consolidated. Uh, and anyway, um, when I came to work the first day, hadn't that had that management letter, walked over to my office and threw it on my desk. You wrote this damn thing down, put it to work and get it all implemented. <laughs> so, you but started, that's really how I got to come in. You started in the mayor's office in 78. Right. Week were, before the blizzard. Oh, uh, you led me right where I was going. You yeah. were there for the blizzard of 78. Yeah, what was that had, like? Barely had gotten um, to started to work. Uh, actually, I hadn't even been confirmed by the uh, city county council uh, until the following week. But um, the mayor's assistant, Reverend Charles Williams, called me and said, um, well, you really ought to come in here and and, uh, spend the night with us. (laughs) (laughs) Literally? (laughs) Literally, because I could not get to work. Um, But um, that's how bad the streets had gotten that quick. But we got down there and... um, it was really everybody in the line of fire, and one of the first things Frick told me was, um, well, we got to get the mayor out of here to save him from himself and let us get everything done here. <laughs> and that's when Frick came up with the idea of getting that uh, hockey uh, cap on him and get him out there on a snowplow, let him be the cheerleader for getting the city cleaned up. In the podcast we did with David Frick, we tried to give him the credit for the racers hat that was so iconic and he when Mayor Hudnett was going around the city and He didn't want to take credit for it? <laughs> I don't recall that he did take credit for it. Yeah, but he said it was a master stroke, obviously. Yeah. And um Did he take credit for stealing the plane tickets? Did David Frick take credit for which? Hudnut was supposed to, the mayor was supposed to go out of town to yes, a mayor's conference. I remember that. Yes. And somehow the tickets disappeared in Mr. Frick's desk. Well, that was based <laughs> on the forecast coming in. It hadn't even snowed yet. Uh, that was, um, if Hudnut would have left, I think it would have been the day before the snow started. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what happened to the tickets, but somehow Mayor decided he wasn't going. He better stay here and uh, oversee the uh, um, storm cleanup. Well, as someone who I think was in fourth grade at the time, it was glorious because that was the only time in my K-12 educational experience that they canceled school for two days in a row at one time. It's so bad that the next two days are canceled, and then we'll worry about it. Lisa, you joined in the mid-'80s, so Mayor Hudnut in the administration was, I think it's fair to say, riding high. What made you decide to go up to the 25th floor of the city-county building and work for Bill Hudnut? Well, I actually went to the 25th floor after a stint as campaign manager for his reelect. So I came off, um, and I'm, I'm not from Indianapolis, so I'm from Pennsylvania and made my way to Indianapolis um, because of love and um, uh, did a four-year stint in uh, West Lafayette, uh, Boiler Up, and I was, in fact, in college during the blizzard, and they canceled class, which was almost unheard of uh, in canceling college classes. So um, I went to work... Uh, on the campaign, uh, as a campaign manager um, for Bill's uh, third race um, as doing uh, the reelect, and it was great. It was a, a wonderful time for, to be campaigning. Uh, he was, 
he, he loved being out on the campaign trail. He, he had was a, on top of his popularity. He was. He was. He was very popular. He had a great story to tell. He loved meeting people. You know, here's someone who probably could have literally sat in his desk at his desk at on the 25th floor, not gone out, and still gotten reelected. I mean, I, I have. I don't believe I got. I did anything except you know, just help push the papers out to for to the voters, but. Uh, he loved being on the campaign trail. He ran like he was one vote behind every single election, and um, it was it was just terrific. In seventy five, he wins his first term in a pretty close race with Bob Welch, who was a very well known executive here in Indianapolis. His subsequent victories were much larger. But Mayor Hudnuts. One of the things we learned in a previous podcast, this one with Mark Miles, I believe he ran the 1979 campaign. So what did Mr. Miles uh, pass on to you in terms of this is how you handle him? This is what he's good at. This is what's important to him. Anything? I also know that not only did we have uh, the mayor's race, we also had the council races as well. And so I believe it was the Mark Miles, David Brooks duo who ran the Hudnut reelect in the council races? So a very you know that two really right. two the really yes, connection. the connection two really great Pauls. Um, uh, Mark just you know Mark's point was you know he's a great campaigner. Put him out there, let him go do what he does best, and work as hard as you possibly can in the background to make sure that the Bill Hudnut story gets told out there. And as Joe said, it was he was riding high on popularity. It was the city was really growing. He, Bill Hudnut was a risk taker with a vision and had great people around him. You you ran his campaign in eighty seven and we're gonna get back to risk taking mm-hmm. here in a little bit. You ran his campaign in eighty seven in November of eighty seven. That was the year that Indianapolis hosted the Pan Am games And one of the things that's come out in previous Leaders and Legends podcast is how important the Pan Am Games were to showcase Indianapolis to the world. What was it like to run a campaign at that time coming off the Pan Am Games? Well, we used the Pan Am Games in a couple of our spots, in our reelect spots. And in fact, it was it was an irony that we Bill had so much going on with the Pan Am Games that we had to remind people he does have a reelection <laughs> race to run and he's got to get out and talk about that. But you had you had him out every day talking about the Pan Am Games, and then it was like, oh, by the way, we we do have to go out here and campaign because you and you, run the city and run the city. So, but he loved all that, and I remember I had the <laughs> the great opportunity to be amigo. Um, he was speaking at an event in Ohio about the Pan Am Games. He was trying to drum up business for to bring bring folks over to to enjoy the games. And then there was a political event just across the border back in um, in Indiana, and they needed somebody to be amigo. And they're like, "Well, if you're going to go with him to this political event, would you mind um, wearing the costume?" And I'm like, "Oh, sure, that's a great idea." The mascot. Oh for my the god, it was terrible. Yes, and. God, that thing smelled, and, and it was, well, who was in it before you? I God only knows. I mean, there there were people, I, I, and and it was hot, and it was you know it, it, whatever. So um, I learned that I did not want to be a mascot for it, <laughs> ever, ever again. But Pan Am Games were terrific, um, uh, and it it did it got. It, it showcased the city to the world, and he loved that. And he got to go around and speak around the state about that at political events. And by the time you had the Colts and the Pan Am Games and all that rolled into one, people loved hearing about what was going on in Indianapolis. Dave Arlen, you, as I recall, left WIBC, is this correct, to I come did. to the administration? <clears throat> my mother said, oh, my God, you're going into politics. And I said, yeah, well, you but... You weren't the first to leave IBC. Tom Henry, we took him, true. too. That's true. That's <laughs> true. It was a great recruiting ground for us. We Very got true. John Bartholomew from in, from IBC when we started the Ballard administration. So it's a there's got to be one spot in local media where you can recruit Republicans. I mean, come on. Well, there's a wonderful story. I, I work for Fred Heckman, and uh, Fred was on vacation when the mayor decided to hire me. So Fred was up in the wilds of Canada somewhere. Nowhere near a phone. But Bill Hudnut found the bait shop phone number, 
or <laughs> Lynn Druding did or somebody did. Somebody did. And uh, got Fred on the phone when he came in to get worms and to get bait one day. And at, he wanted to get Fred's permission to hire me. He didn't want to honk off, you know, the number one radio news guy in the, in the state, arguably. So he got that permission. And uh, I joined the team in 1988. So, And what made you decide to make that move? I mean, radio in the late 80s is a little bit different than radio in, in 2019 or 2020. So was it something about him specifically or was it about just changing industries? I think it was uh, the, the legacy that he had already built and – his popularity as a speaker nationally, uh, the way that he carried himself, the way you know he, he liked to talk about a competitive city, but also a compassionate city, and I found that to be very attractive and alluring, and uh, I wanted to be part of that. And uh, about three weeks into being his press secretary, he had been at the Republican convention that year, and he came back and he called me into his office and he. Uh, used an expletive to point out that he hadn't been on television in three weeks. So, you know, what what was I doing with my job? <laughs> uh, so, uh, but, you know, that's okay. Very, very high expectations. That actually prepared me for future uh, future positions, and that was good. By the time you got there, so you're talking about the last three years of a 16-year run, was there hudnut fatigue in the media or was he still just the same big story that he always was? Well, I think he was the same big story in the sense that uh, by that time, the so-called Hudnut Forever bill had passed the state legislature. So there was no longer a term limitation on on mayors. They could be mayor as long as they want. Uh, he had other political ambitions. Uh, he ran unsuccessfully for secretary of state, and several of us were involved with that effort. That was difficult. Uh, because he lost, he wasn't a, uh, wasn't used to losing, and of course he he lost to the the man who's our current mayor, Mayor Hogsett. Um, so and- when you saw the Hogsett, we don't do politics on Leaders and Legends podcast, but when you saw the ad that Mayor Hogsett did in his successful reelect in 2019, where he extolled the virtues of Mayor Hudnut, was it like, well, he saw the light or? Yeah, every every time I know we don't do politics, but since you opened that door, <laughs> gently. Every, <laughs> gently, every time I saw that ad, in my head, I saw the ad with the little mayor's limo crossing the screen from the Secretary of State's race with the scroll of all the taxes that had not imposed, you know. And you don't get to where we are just by being static. And if there's a criticism of some of the other mayors that I would levy uh, is, you know, people tend to be very, very, very cautious because – it's real easy, as you know, Robert, to step into it. And uh, We did that frequently in the Ballard administration. <laughs> Speaking of, now that's the opposite. Greg Ballard to be like, why am I doing all this media? Not get me on TV. It's like, why am I doing this TV? Well, we talked about boldness a few minutes ago. Well, Deputy you know, Mayor Slash was there for the boldest of the boldest. Well, I was going to come back to uh, pick up on something Dave just said you know, about um, the ad with the tax hikes. We were um, first term. A um, couple things happened. Number one, the uh, we had the uh, Bowen tax freezes on property taxes, so there was a there was a limit to how how much um, tax raise you could have annually, tied to the growth of assessed valuation. That was it. Um, but more importantly, we had several federal revenue grants um, that uh, under the um, President Reagan's administration were eliminated, namely revenue sharing. Revenue sharing were free dollars from the federal government to city governments to do whatever you wanted to. And those dollars were in police and fire pensions and streets. Paving streets. I mean, nothing helps you get elected more than fresh concrete and asphalt, and Hutton Dud used that. So we were able, with the federal revenue sharing, um, to pave, uh, I remember, 220 plus street miles. And when that money was eliminated, 
we will put in for the next year's budget 20 miles of paving and then struggle to how are we going to keep police and fire floating without laying off police and firemen. Well, that became a job that Fred Armstrong and I and several other people had to figure out how are we going to keep from laying off. We just basically put a freeze on hiring police and firemen. But that necessitated us going to the legislature um, to work with other cities and towns to get um, local option income tax because we weren't the only city that lost those federal dollars. And so other cities were anxious to replace those dollars, too. So that was the first of the tax hikes. And um, other tax hikes um, that were referred to um, in that ad were – basically bond issue tax hikes to take care of sewers that had to be um, um, replaced and added, um, give us more money for um, street construction. Uh, But those were necessitated because we lost revenue. We had to find ways to replace it. So those were tight years. They were really tight years in trying to get by on very restricted funds. So it was about a two-year period that we were operating without those federal dollars before the local option income tax dollars and then then, uh, subsequently the um, wheel tax dollars started flowing back to the city. And um, we managed to get through that. We sold it to the public. And um, people could see the improvements, and um, we moved on. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer, since I just mentioned his name. How did Mayor Hudnut cultivate local leaders, local businessmen, to buy in to a lot of these ideas and bold moves to put Indianapolis in a place that nobody could have predicted in, say, the mid-60s, and I'm talking about people like P.E. McAllister and many others. Lisa? I think he checked his ego at the door. I believe there – he didn't care who got credit for what was happening, and he – now, he didn't – he would like Dave to get him on TV or on radio or get a good article out there, but I felt like – We'd come back from somewhere, and he'd say, you know, that guy was really great. Do you think there's a position for him on a board, or, or perhaps he can, he can, can co- we come in and talk about some of his ideas? And I think he, he really he checked the politics of that particular person aside. He put his ego to the back and, and said, let's see what we can get done for the city. And that, I believe, was attractive to – businessmen and women who wanted to come in and wanted to help. And this might have been their first opportunity to sit down and look at government and go, gosh, you know, I've never been involved with government. I'm, you know, I'm out here doing my, my, my thing and either creating jobs or doing my, my day-to-day job. But what can I do to come help Indianapolis? And I think Bill Hudnut was the kind of person who said, you know, he's famous for saying, you can't be a suburb of nothing. We've got this downtown that we have to grow. And because if we don't do that, we're going to find ourselves not not biding time and not treading water, but we're going to go backwards. We're, 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 not, we're not going forwards if we do not, not going forward if we just don't have people to come and help us. This is just a guess. Hmm. Do you believe that Mitch Daniels learned that particular aspect of governing and leadership from Bill Hudnut, considering the people who populated his administration while he was governor? You know, I, I would – Mitch Daniels is a, a, a very smart guy, and I think he likes to say that he takes the best ideas from people and puts them forward. So I wouldn't pretend to know that 
as a fact, but I would say it certainly helped. And um, Princeton cultivated both of those gentlemen very well. Robert, he wouldn't hesitate to invite business and civic leaders in to just throw the ideas out. As he said, we've got a real dilemma here, and I need your help. And this is what we're dealing with, and I need some input, and um, we've got to make some decisions if we're going to move forward. And um, you also use the uh, Greater Indianapolis Progress Committee. I remember uh, several occasions where we just had brain-picking sessions with the executive um, board of the Progress Committee and then throw it out there to the uh, committee as a whole and once you got the Progress Committee to buy in, the Chamber of Commerce was pretty well represented there, um, then it was time to go sell the public. But because you had uh, community leaders involved with the Progress Committee, um, and they bought into a project like the Dome, mm -hmm. um, it was go forth, as he said, go forth and spread the seed. <laughs> and uh, there we go. Uh, so... There was just a lot of communication. He was a great communicator, and um, like Lisa said, he didn't care what the politics were. If we needed your support to buy into a project, bring them in, he said. Dave, you mentioned something earlier about a compassionate city. How much do you believe Mayor Hudnut's background as an ordained Presbyterian minister affected his worldview, A, and B, how he governed the city? Well, he was uh, frequently quoted, uh, and I heard him from the pulpit say, um, I do not uh, preach politics from the pulpit and vice versa. I mean, he in his head, there was a very clear demarcation. You know, you didn't I think he was distressed uh, by what He's we see today. He's a firm believer in the separation of church and right. state. Even and though he, he was a Presbyterian minister. Uh, and so I think there was that ethos. Uh, that, that was his upbringing. His father, who he quoted frequently, William H. Hudnut II, uh, and his grandfather, uh, all men of the cloth. And um, Really? They were all ministers? They were all ministers, yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, he talked about mm -hmm. at home— uh, over the dinner table, it was always about education and, and a lot of discussion uh, amongst the children. You know, I mean, his parents held him to very high esteem and very high expectations. And I think that that kind of washed downhill for those of us who worked for him. But he would also set the tone. I mean, there were issues that we had. I, I don't want to, you know, pass over the point that there were some difficult things. Police community relations, very, very difficult. Infant mortality, Still an issue in Indianapolis, but it was a, a severe issue at that time. And so he would carve up those issues just like he carve up streets, uh, bringing people together. And, you know, we are blessed or we were blessed uh, and still are with the Lilly Endowment and uh, uh, the munif munificence of that organization. Uh, there would be no Hoosier Dome without them. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the other decisions that were made going after the Pan Am Games – uh, you know, a lot of the other things that happened, it was a collective effort. He, somebody's got to be in charge, right? The mayor's still got to be in charge. But he wasn't afraid of taking risks. I wore my Colts socks today. <laughs> so, yeah, I was in Baltimore two weeks ago, and I was wearing a Colts scarf on my winter coat, and I took it off and put it away. Those people are still angry. It's been 35 years. Family out there yeah. Still, man. Yeah. Well, I grew up. Yeah, and, we're gonna, and I want to ask you about that spe specific thing. Ask everybody. We're here with Dave Arlen, Lisa Dietrich, and Joe Slash, all part of the extended Hudnut family, talking about the man, Mayor Hudnut, and his time, uh, 16 years leading the city of Indianapolis. One thing, and, and maybe all of you, but particularly Dave, what was Mayor Hudnut's reaction? How did it affect him when the civic leaders perished in the plane crash in the early 90s. Michael Carroll, Bob Welch, Frank McKinney, and others. Frank, he was supposed to go on that trip, but he didn't. Yeah, it was he, he was Michael uh, Carroll was his deputy mayor. Welch was his opponent in 75, right. but they 
We're all working together to make the city that much better. And they were headed to Ameriflora, which was a big uh, floral event in Columbus, uh, Ohio. And there was a tragic accident. I don't think they got out of Indiana, as I recall. They never did no, get they never too did. far from the airport. Right. Yeah. I think that was after Hudnut's term. It was because I, I – yeah, because I actually remember I was at an event where he was speaking and he made that announcement. That was I know I had left the um, administration before that happened. John Wheelover. Yeah, that you know that's a very tough thing. I mean, that's a I would look at that as an example. Here are a group of civic uh, leaders. Uh, I don't know if they had been dispatched by Mayor Goldsmith or they were just going on their own, but. Uh, that, I think, speaks to the spirit of Indianapolis and people collectively working together. It was also a time when the banks were owned locally. That's a good point. You know, so it, That's come up before, actually. Yep. Th- things are quite a bit different than what they used to be. Let's talk about, the, the, I hate to say, the singular signature accomplishment of the HUDNET years. But it's, it's pretty hard to top building a dome stadium with no team. And that would seem to be the, the rock, paper, and scissors of, well, <laughs> of taking a chance and being ri- and I, taking a risk. So, Robert, I Deputy can, Mayor I can Slack, tell you, you were the, there. Uh, conversations that were held leading up to making that decision, and the um, decision to go forward was made at the mayor's house, meeting with um, leaders of the city council, leaders of the uh, chamber of commerce and a few other civic leaders. And I remember uh, while we were having this conversation and the risk we would be taking, the mayor leaning over to me and said, um, Slash, you know, if this doesn't work, we're going to both be looking for a new place to live. <laughs> now, <laughs> and, but people bought into it, and here again, you know, he went with that great sales pitch to the community and this is what we need to do we've got to expand the convention center in order to uh, bring in more business and oh by the way we've got a way to build a stadium along with it for future activities which could have which could have been football and could have been baseball yeah Yeah, because welch wanted to own bob welch wanted to own the baseball team well he wanted to own a professional sports he wanted to own the sports team but uh, p McAllister told me that that Hudnut, Mayor Hudnut built that stadium knowing that knowing A, excuse my language, A, the NFL was looking to expand, which it did, and B, that teams were dissatisfied with their dilapidated stadiums that had been built in the 30s and 40s and were looking for upgraded facilities. So so it's a complete and total unbelievable game changer. But PE told me, look, we knew we had opportunities out there. Well, and I think um – uh, somebody, some other people behind the scenes that I think helped initiate the conversations um, with the coat were the uh, Simon brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, they were committed to this city with the Pacers, and they really wanted to get a NFL team here, and um, they were willing to help the mayor and did. Um, so there were a lot of people that pitched in to make this happen, but I remember – when it came down to um, uh, Ursay making that decision, um, if you recall, he had made a decision to go to Arizona a year before. And people in Arizona leaked it before um, Ursay could um, inform the governor and the mayor and other people out there. And he reversed his decision and stayed in Baltimore. So Hudnut wanted to make sure that nobody was going to leak this up. So <laughs> well, people were all holed up at the Columbia Club. Wives couldn't tell anybody where we were. And um, Hudnut said, not until I get the phone call. I remember him saying he and Johnny B. Smith, his next-door neighbor, who was the CEO of Mayflower, uh, Johnny B. said, I know my Trucks are out there somewhere, just like in Eisenhower's World War II, <laughs> waiting on the word to go forth. I mean, that's what he said. And, um, you know, when that phone call came in, I mean, the press were going mad trying to find somebody to get comments about this thing. And um, I know it was serious. He said, we're not going to blow this deal. 
So we're going to make sure people can't talk. We're going to get them all holed up together in here. And so when the call came in and he was able to um, make the announcement, the, the trucks were already on the move. So he was very careful and wanted to make sure that uh, we weren't going to have the same fate as the people in Arizona had had the year before. But um, it was very important. Lisa, you were part of the Hudnut family by then. How much were you in on the scoop? And what was your reaction? Was it like the old man pulled it off? I can't believe it. I wasn't um, I wasn't in that circle, if you will. Um, I had bittersweet feelings because of Baltimore, right? It was one of the teams I grew up with. But I'm like, well, okay, fine. They're, they're, we'll bring him to Indianapolis so I can watch him here. Um, but it was great. You could – because I was, um, because I I been around the mayor a long time, and I could tell this was, it was such a watershed event for the city, but it was a watershed event for Bill Hudnut, and and I I think he was so excited that a gamble like this magnitude really paid off, and that it, I mean, when you just think of everything that it that that accomplishment has done for the city even even today and I, I i you know jumping ahead to when the super bowl was here and and bill came into town and i jumped into kind of the former staff member role and Which took we a, all can't help yep yeah <laughs> you all you know once an, once an advanced man always an advanced man and so um he and bev were going to go um over on georgia street and they were going to go ride the um one of the zip line and so i said well i'll get you over there and it took an hour to go literally a block and people stop of course it helps when you're tall right he's yeah, about but six yeah. six it can't hide in a crowd six five six seventeen as he used to say <laughs> but um and and the weather was cooperating right so you had lots of people out there but it took him an hour to go a block and and people just stopped him. And he said, we got over there. And he goes, I really thought people had forgotten me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I, I said, especially here you are at the Super Bowl. There wouldn't be a Super Bowl here if the Indianapolis Colts hadn't come to town. And um, I think I, I look at that at that particular moment. And then um, when he came back for the dedication of the Hudnut Commons and they, he went on the uh, the field, and they introduced him to the crowd, and he got an ovation. He said, "Well, I, I just, you know, it's been such a long time. I just thought people might have forgotten me." And I'm like, "Well, they, they sitting in this building, they sure as heck don't forget." You know, I the think role. people might forget other mayors, but they're not going to forget him. I think, I think that's right, Joe. Spangle, can I tell the? Think I could tell that Malangdon, Allison Malangdon story without uh, shedding a tear? Doubtful. So, in the podcast we did with Allison Malangdon, who was. Uh, running the Super Bowl committee and obviously she and her staff completely knocked it out of the park as Allison does everything. She told the story about leaving the Super Bowl headquarters, which was on South Street and walking to the Super Bowl village. And she said, as I was walking to the village, I saw a tall man in the crowd and realized that it was former Mayor Hudnut. And she said, I went up to him to say hello. And she said, as I got closer, I noticed he was crying. And her response was, you know, Mayor, are you okay? And he said something to the effect of this is what it was all about. Mm -hmm. This is why we did all the things that we did. One of the things that, that Mayor Hudnut exuded as much of anything, as much as anything. And Dave, I want to ask you about this. Is just the incredible pride as to where Indianapolis was. Not that he didn't get left a pretty nice uh, city by the previous mayor, Richard Luger. But when it came to the end of his term and he looked back and you were there, Dave, what were his thoughts? What did he talk to you about when you drove with him or, you know, we're the press guys, right? So we're always in the car with him as they're going from place to place. What did he say? How did he reflect? 
he was concerned about his legacy and that it not be railroaded by uh, future mayors and that it would be obvious, you know, who did what. Um, I ran across some papers this morning I was digging through in my basement and I found a book proposal that he had put together with a professor who's still at uh, IUPUI. And Bill had made very, you know, detailed notes about the set, the chapters, and uh, Lisa, I think, was involved in this project. I Frankly, I had forgotten about it. Uh, and then at the very last line is, uh, how will Dave do it? You know, meaning, how will I write the book? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think he wrote two, two books, uh, After Minister Mayor, uh, which was written while he was mayor. Um, so sure, he was concerned about his legacy, and he talked about um, – about that in the car. Um, he worried a little bit about what was next. You know, uh, what do you do after you're this super popular mayor and you've elected on your own not to run again? He felt it was time for somebody else to take over. And, uh, Did you get a sense it would be Goldsmith? Stephen Goldsmith, oh, yeah, yeah. The Marion County prosecutor, ran for mayor in 91. Of course, yes. Uh, and, and there was no love loss between the two of them until late in his life. Uh, both sides, I think, came together and, and kind of laid down their arms, so to speak. Um, and, and kudos to Mayor Goldsmith for that, you know, because that meant a lot, I think, uh, to Mayor Bill. And Bill left Indianapolis, went to Chicago for a period, and then on out to Washington, D.C. to uh, uh, be part of the Urban Land Institute. Uh, he was a mayor of Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, most people don't know that because he was he got elected to the city council and in that particular community they they or Chevy, Chevy Chase, Chase not Bethesda Chevy Chase. right next to Bethesda yeah mm-hmm. uh, they rotate the mayorship so he actually got to be mayor again now admittedly it wasn't you know a big city but I think he he and Bev enjoyed that I'll tell you what he didn't enjoy he said one night some guy called him <laughs> just griping about the fact that somebody's leaf blower was too loud in this next door neighbor and he feels like did you all get calls like that when I was mayor about people were complaining about stuff and I'm like well yeah, yeah, yeah. we did well, yeah. Yeah. you never heard about it that's but right. we did that's right but you yeah just, you just had all of us to be the yeah, potholes and <laughs> chuckles and you know fix the crack in my sidewalk he w- you know I one of my notes, uh, I, I found some speech notes from a speech he gave his last year, and he would say since he became mayor that together we have created over 100,000 jobs and opened more than 5,000 new businesses. That's quite an accomplishment. And I'm sure any mayor can make mm-hmm. claims of that type. But, you know, he was mayor for a long time, almost uh, four decades. So Did it? Did he and and I would I'm going to ask Deputy Mayor slash this too, but did he ever talk about what it was like to follow Richard Luger, who you who wasn't Senator Luger? You know, he wasn't this this sort of Indi- Hoosier icon that that Richard Luger became, but clearly an unbelievably transformative mayor, not only politically but in terms of policy and impact. Did he ever say, "Man, you know what? I had a tough act to follow," or did he? Or was it more like we have to create our own legacy? It was more like the blueprint has been created. We have to carry it on and add to it. As I Did remember, they get along pretty I, well? I, oh, yeah. Or well, yeah, Luger absolutely. And, and I remember, uh, the, you know, the, the if I would have to say the linchpin of the start of the redevelopment of downtown was the decision that Mayor Luger made to build Market Square Arena. Because the owners wanted to build out at Traders Point, and that's when Hutton, I mean Luger, said, "If we're going to be a first-class city, we've got to build a first-class arena for our basketball team." And so the decision was made to build Market Square. Um, that spurred the decision to build um, only the second new hotel that had been built in downtown since back in the 30s or 40s, and. Um, that would be the um, Hyatt Regency that's actually built on city-owned land. A lot of people don't know. There was a long-term land lease created to build that plaza, and um, the city actually gets revenue off of the land lease that um, the Hyatt Regency and PNC Bank sit on. Um, and um, that was necessary because 
there was no hotel in the area built to house basketball players with high ceilings and high showers. <laughs> so there's and a that, couple that floors. Market, up, couple market floors Square Arena up. story has come up multiple I mean, times. But it's, Bill it's Benner, important. like that is that is a huge, huge catalyst. Well, so, so basically, uh, Dutt said, you know, the blueprints laid out here. We've got to build on it. And, and there were some, building, yeah, which he convinced. Um, the one America United, building, yeah, because they wanted United to build up. Life yeah, they wanted to, to build up uh, out of uh, downtown, and right. that took some work. I know Frick was uh, very involved in um, uh, buying out the properties uh, that were along uh, this block of Indiana Avenue that came all the way down into um, Capitol at the time. I mean Illinois at the time, but uh, he was very involved in piecing together the land deals. To make this possible, um, as I remembered, uh, one of the conversations involved in um, who's going to pay for all this utility relocation, and it was kind of quite, quite a complicated matter to get all this piece together to make this building happen for um, it was uh, AUL at the time, but it, it happened, and here we are. I, I was really struck uh, before we started uh, recording. Today, Robert, we were Joe and I were looking out across the circle. Way, you know, we're 30 floors in the air looking down on Monument Circle, and I was struck by two things. One, the amount of housing downtown now. At a time when, uh, just before Hudnut became a congressman, uh, the JCs were hired to shoot pigeons downtown. <laughs> I, I lived here. I remember that. Yeah. I mean, it was that's crazy, but that that's what <laughs> that was downtown Indianapolis, you know. And and frankly, for there was no one here. There was no one here. Well, and, it was a, and it was a real chicken and egg conversation about so, so uh, getting housing, <laughs> housing. And I remember um, Richard Blankenbaker was our public safety director at that time. The developers didn't want to commit to housing. There was no grocery store anywhere else to shop downtown. And uh, Richard Blankenbaker was the person that got Joe O'Malley committed. If we put this building project together, just take the old Sears store and make it suitable for a grocery store, he committed to put a store downtown. And that's when um, developers made the first commitments to build uh, condos that are just north of there or uh, by the English building. I forget the name of Brown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing and uh, that became very the, uh, that was the linchpin to the um, housing and shopping downtown. One one particular event, and and Deputy Mayor Slash would have been there, I believe, because I couldn't find the date. But as a kid, I remember it because it was such amazing TV, and that is when the police officers pulled all their cars downtown, turned on the sirens and the lights and threw all their keys in a bucket and told the mayor to give it the HUD nut hook. Now the HUD nut hook was made famous. I remember this as a kid when he was talking about picking up litter and picking up trash and he did a hook shot, which was much more popular back in the NBA and ABA of the 70s than it is today. But it was a very famous commercial, Mm -hmm. had a lot of impact, and the police department, the police officers used it against him when they basically struck for better benefits and pay. Did he ever talk about that? They wanted to keep their take-home card. They wanted all this other money and then uh, to keep their take-home cars. um, That's what made them turn the cars around and park them. And I think he was out of town for that, was he not? Yeah. Yeah. It was either a National League of yeah, Cities I or a com- Rick held the conference of mayor's head. meeting, one of the two. And the reason I'm bringing that up in particular is to ask an, a, a question, related question. What's the angriest you ever saw Bill Hudnut? Dave, you first. <laughs> Gosh. Oh, my. You know, his background in the in the theological seminary must have been helpful here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. I think it wasn't angry so much as frustrated. You know, a lot of the things that we dealt with are are just just vexing problems that are frustrating. And we had uh, a couple of police action shootings that were just ripping the community apart. And it wasn't Warburg killing. 
uh, Michael um, Taylor uh, incident. Yeah, I was there then, yeah. And that was uh, very difficult. It was hard on him. It was hard on us. Nobody wants to well, carry that I mean, on Let me shoulders. tell you the extent. I'm, you know, Richard Blankenbaker um, was public safety director during that period. And, you know, the frustration on Hutnut's part. And uh, Richard obviously was having some medical issues, and I tried to get him to go home. And he wanted to get a briefing from the chief because this city was about to come unglued. Um, and while we were waiting right across the table from me, Richard had a stroke and looked up and said, I cannot move my limbs. I mean, that's the kind of stress that that incident put this city under. And um, When was the Michael Taylor incident? Early 90s? 86. 86? 1986. 86, and um, nobody believed that could happen that a person with handcuffs could get out of them and reach and get a weapon out of their sock, so to speak, until I saw a 50-year-old pot-bellied police detective sit on the couch and do it so fast. And I had cop after cop tell me, you don't know how many times we put somebody in the back of a car with cuffs on them. And by the time we get to the um, jail or wherever we're going, they're sitting there with their hands on the front. And um, ironically, um, in Memphis, Tennessee, that same week, there was a very similar incident that uh, we found out about. That, um, and, and I never saw Hudnett as frustrated as he was during that period of time. I mean, just, why can't the cops find a weapon on somebody, you know? And that's when we made a decision we got to get magnetometers to put people through when they're being arrested. Um, no excuse for not finding a weapon on somebody. And um, that, that was one of the most frustrating times I've seen her. I mean, he was just not, as you say, not angry, but just why can't we get it across the cops that we can't have this happen? Did it, did it matter to him to be seen as a gentle person in public and then come back to the office and let it go. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend who uh, used to tell me when, when he found out I went to work for the mayor, he said, well, you know, Hudnut wrote that book, Minister Mayor. He said, you'll probably want to write another book called Minister My Ass, you know. <laughs> uh, he's human. Of course he got frustrated. I mean, I'm sure Mayor Ballard got frustrated, too. Same with Mayor Hogsett, I'm sure. Uh, was, was it because, well, but, let me ask a quick, quick question, because one of the things that, that Mayor Ballard got frustrated about, and we're going to ask Lisa about political anger and frustration because i think that's where public officials feel like they can't control it as much but mayor ballard would come back and he and see if there's a parallel to mayor hudnut mayor ballard would come back and be frustrated that people didn't get it like this is what i'm trying to do it's the best thing for the city why doesn't person x y or z just understand that this is the best thing for the city that was where mayor ballard would get i'm gonna i'm gonna turn your question on its ear and tell a humorous story, a short one. Um, we were at a National League of Cities meeting in uh, in uh, Savannah, Georgia, and we keep bringing up these national organizations because Hudnut was a Republican in a land of Democrat uh, city officials. I mean, it's sort of a fish out of water, so he was always tapped for all these things. Uh, President Reagan was supposed to come speak to uh, said group, and he, Reagan said, "I'm not coming." And so a New York Times reporter, uh, unbeknownst to me, called uh, Hudnut directly and wanted to comment. And uh, the mayor said, well, I guess the president doesn't care about the nation's cities, which ended up in I remember print, that. Um, in the New York I Times. I remember reading about that. Yeah. And I got Lee Atwater on the phone to me from a pay phone screaming. I mean, uh, I've never heard language like that from somebody. And that was just Hudnut's, you know, jabbing a Republican to say, hey, wait a minute. You know, there are Republicans out here. You can't just do that. You can't just not show up when you said you were going to come. So, And did, did Mayor Hudnut recant or repent? Of course not. He, he reveled in that uh, skewer. That's when he dumps it off on deputy mayors. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> he, he, said, he said the initials DM stand for dumping manure. <laughs> <laughs> We're here on the Leaders and Legends podcast with Dave Arlen, Lisa Dietrich, and Joe Slash, all part of the extended Hudnut family. We're discussing Mayor Bill Hudnut and his time as mayor. Lisa, you ran two of his mayoral election campaigns. 
Um, I worked for a mayor who eh, called me his political hack, and he didn't mean it as a compliment. Would it be fair to say that you were, if not as, as hack-ass, is, <laughs> is that a term? <laughs> Did you enjoy being part of the political world involving Mayor Hudnut? I mean, these elections weren't tough. But still, how did he campaign? Dave said earlier he liked to be out and among the people. You said the same thing. But was it tough to deal with him politically? Well, for me personally, no, not tough to deal with him politically because he loved campaigning. He never really stopped campaigning. For him, it was, I'm going out today. Who can I see? Who can I touch? Who can I maybe change this person's mind? You know, he liked to, he liked to zero in on the person down there who looked like they were the naysayer, who didn't really want to talk to the mayor because they might be mad at the mayor. And he would just go right at it and say, hey, I'm Bill Hudnut. How are you? You know, what's on your mind? And if somebody laid into him, he'd sit there and he'd listen. And then he'd typically come back to the office and the campaign and tell people, and you go fix this. But you asked about seeing him mad. Um, and, and in politics, oftentimes a, a, a politician or a candidate gets mad at themselves, particularly if they say something wrong. In this case, I believe um, at least these two gentlemen will remember the University of Tennessee issue where Bill Hednut cruised into victory. Uh, in a in re- which year? I, I believe it was 83. I believe it was the 83. Um, Might have been 87. It could have been 87. I, I, you know what? I can't remember. Is this incident foreign to me? I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, okay. Oh, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a great one. <laughs> it's better than um, fucking out the president of the United States. Yeah. And so Bill Hudnut's going to cruise to victory. And um, I'm at campaign headquarters, which is also with Marion, at Marion County Republican headquarters. And um, a call comes in. call comes in and they're asking um, – the, the reporter on the line asks if to speak with me. And the person um, – who answers the phone says, I'm not sure if she's here. And I'm standing right next to the phone. And um, he said, let me find her and I'll, I'll, I'll call you back. I'll have her call you back. And, um, and they hung up and I said, well, who was that? And they said, well, it was a reporter. And it just sounded like he had some very pressing thing he needed to ask you. And I wanted to make sure that we had checked it out. And I'm like, well, I don't know what that might be. And it was the fact that Bill Hudnut, unbeknownst to anyone, had applied for to be the president of the University of Tennessee. And because in the middle of a reelect. And um, with just weeks to go. With, yeah, literally with ahead. just weeks to go way ahead in the polls and had be, University of Tennessee. It's public. It was, was it 87? Public. It's a public university. And so it's a public record. And what had happened is someone down in Knoxville or wherever mm-hmm. had found it in the – had found his application in – handwritten, mind you, application <laughs> in the files and had called up to the Indianapolis Star to say, do you know – that your mayor has applied for this, and that person called and asked for me. And thank goodness I didn't get that phone call. Because what? <laughs> I, I mean, what would you have said? Like, are you crazy? That can't ask, be right. I can't think of another term and, to and use. And so, um, so very quick, quickly after that, it broke. And um, He was very concerned about losing the he was, he's, he he was somewhere He was sincerely to go. concerned that he was going to lose. Yeah, because in 87, his, his re-elect number dipped. The percentage, dipped, I think, was the, right. the lowest right. since 75, right. I think. Well, yeah, you've been, you know, it's your, right. He thought he could have gotten beat. And it's your four, you know, you're going into your yeah. fourth term. There's some stuff, right. You've got, you know, you have a record, good, and sometimes a bad. People are complaining about you didn't pave my street or whatever. Sure. And so, um, did he pull his name out? Uh, he did, and well, and, I mean, he and was went. After he was that concerned. Michael went on TV, looked straight at the camera, and said, "I want to be your mayor." And so it, you know, it 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 turned, and things were fine. I can tell you, being in the same room when John Sweezy, the Republican chairman, was talking to Bill Hudnut about what he had just done <laughs> was was an eye opener for me. Okay, so let's turn the question around. Let's let's let me play Dave Arlen. What's the angriest you've ever been, Lisa? Or did I just hear it? I think you just heard it. At Bill Hudnut. I, I mean I, did you I, I think you just heard it. You say we're no longer staffer and mayor here, we're 
Right. Now, because now what we've done is we've taken we, we've taken the opportunity for you to get reelected for your fourth term. And now it it is in question. Right. Good news is we have money in the bank. Um, and he went on TV and it gave him the opportunity to look in the camera and talk about why he loved being mayor. But he was concerned. And it, it but John Sweezy, I, the two of them, I I think they were screaming at each other. Good for John Sweezy. And he I was in the it. military. I was I was in right. New Mexico, so I didn't know that story. Yeah. Dave, I want to ask you a quick question, and then we're going to close up the podcast here in a minute. I meant to ask this earlier when you talk about HUDNet being involved in all these uh, organizations with cities. Yes. Can anyone tell me what it was like for the first National League of Cities meeting after he plucked the Colts out of Baltimore when he (coughs) happened to run up against the mayor of Baltimore? Mayor Schaefer, I think you, or he was mayor, then governor. Mayor who became governor, governor. yeah. I think that would have been the year. um, Say we're talking 1983, 84. 84 is when we had it here. Yeah. You know, Hudnut used to say, uh, and I I rehearsed this line when I was in the airport in Baltimore last week, (laughs) Indianapolis didn't steal the Colts, Baltimore lost the Colts. Mm Mm-hmm. And you mentioned, Robert, the, the decrepit stadium. Memorial Stadium, yes. And Ursay had tried to get a new stadium, and they had been re- he rebuked him. And David Frick and the podcast with him tells a great story kind of about how all that happened. And But it would be interesting to be at a National League of Cities meeting or U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting, and the guy in the room used to be the mayor of the city that well, had the Colts, and that now guy, you're the mayor. That guy never got over it, ever. So you know, and he did Hudnut ever repent? I mean, he and like, you know, we Hudnut could... were close before that, right? And um, yeah. and did Hudnut ever say? Did Mayor Hudnut ever say? You know, I wish we just would have had our own team that that someone locally I, had owned, I as think, opposed to doing it this way. Well, I think you have to look at the opportunities that are out there, and uh, I'm sure the Colts weren't the only one. Uh, look, I mean, look what Baltimore got a few years later. The Cleveland Browns. You know, they learned the Raiders moved and the Rams moved. So people move around. That's that's what happened. I think the one thing that um, I'll remember always is that um, and I was reminded by this. I know it's a podcast. I can't show you a a picture, but here's a picture from his official bio that we used to distribute. And it's him reading to children. And it just reminds me that we always had to block time on his calendar for certain things. And going to the public yep. library to read to kids was sacrosanct. He, you know, he really enjoyed doing that. That was really important. Here's the only thing time he used to like to do is go out in the yep. park and I get wet with the kids in the summertime. We'll take some pictures and we'll mm-hmm. post them up. The only time that I met him prior to work to me working for Mayor Ballard is he would have. All of the kids who were on the brain game Mm -hmm. up to the 25th floor. And that was a huge deal because you got to go to the observatory. And, you know, it's a different city back then. But he was very interested in education and and young folks. Uh, We've come to the end of the podcast, but we're going to end on a on a particular note. Uh, We're going to ask everybody a question and get their very quick response. Deputy Mayor Joe Slash, if you had to use one word to describe Bill Hudnut, which word would you use and why? Magnificent leader. Because Bill could coalesce even the most difficult adversaries. And one of the things that I never will forget that I can say I learned from Bill Hudnut how to keep your friends close and your enemies closer, and how to turn your adversary into your advocate. He was great at doing that. Greatest lesson learned. Lisa, which word would you use and why? Caring. And I feel that he always said he would like to be remembered as someone who governed well and cared about people. And I always remember him caring about people and, and, and caring about what they said and what their situation was or could be. And so I, when I think of Bill Hudnut, I think of caring. Dave Arlen? Very high expectations. He demanded that of us, and we delivered for him, I hope. There's so many things that we didn't get a chance to talk about. The creation of the Sports Corp, his relationship with Andy Jacobs, which was by all accounts, terrific uh, former political opponents, but very good friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
the list goes on and on. Um, it's been a while since I've read it, but if I could try to accurately paraphrase Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, why man he doth bestride this city like a colossus. And that's what Bill Hudnut was, a colossus. And all of us who are either from this city, love this city, or both are incredibly indebted to him, his leadership, his courage, his personality, and his presence. Thank you, Joe Slash. Thank you, Lisa Dietrich. Thank you, Dave Arlen. We appreciate your time today. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. 